Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. And welcome to your Friday edition of On The Money, where we're focused on the UK's cost of living crisis, as ever, helping you to beat the squeeze. I'm Liam Halligan, and we're going to be asking today if the government will impose a windfall tax on those oil and gas companies operating in the UK. The energy giants have made huge profits as war in Ukraine has sent oil and gas prices soaring. Could some of that cash be diverted to households struggling to make ends meet? Plus. We meet the woman the government's asked to help the UK's small and medium-sized firms. All that and more on The Money, after the GB News headlines with Rhiannon Jones. Thank you, Liam. It's one minute past one. Your top stories from the GB Newsroom. Unions are threatening national strikes over government plans to axe around 90,000 civil service jobs. The Prime Minister wants to free up billions of pounds to ease the cost of living crisis. Downing Street hasn't ruled out compulsory redundancies, but it's hoped a lot of the cuts will occur through natural attrition. Brexit Opportunities Minister Jacob Rees-Mogg says the cull will make the government more efficient. What is being proposed is our hiring freeze. Uh, up to 38,000 people leave the civil service every year. So over two to three years, that's how you achieve this number. And then if those jobs are essential, ministers can sign off people being moved into them so that you can continue the level of service simply with a smaller number of people. Well, Labour's condemned the plans. Shadow Scotland Secretary Ian Murray says cutting the workforce isn't the answer is the ideas that they have to try and deal with the cost of living crisis which is very real now and engulfing the country then they are out of touch and they are arrogant to the needs of the of the public in terms of them opening those energy bills and seeing the huge hikes and of course opening their pay slips and seeing their tax going up which was a decision by this chancellor to do on the 1st of april the DUP says it will block the election of a new speaker to the Northern Ireland Assembly. It says the move will send a clear message to the EU and the government that the post-Brexit trading agreement isn't working and that the protocol risks peace in the country. Party leader Sir Geoffrey Donaldson also says the DUP won't nominate a deputy first minister, preventing a new executive from forming. If the European Union is serious about protecting the political institutions, and the Belfast Agreement and its successor agreements, the basis of political progress and stability in Northern Ireland, then they know what they need to do. And equally, the same message is there for our own government as well. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe is meeting the Prime Minister at Downing Street. The former British aid worker, who was held captive for six years, is speaking to Boris Johnson for the first time since returning to the UK in March. They're expected to discuss why it took so long to secure her release and how the government can help other British citizens being held hostage abroad. The UK has announced 12 new sanctions against Russia, targeting President Putin's financial network, including his ex-wife and cousins. The Foreign Secretary, who's in Germany for a G7 meeting, says pressure also needs to be applied on Moscow by supplying more weapons to Ukraine. The EU has announced it's providing a further £425 million worth of military support and hopes a deal can be reached for an embargo on Russian oil. Liz Truss spoke ahead of today's talks. It's very important at this time that we keep up the pressure on Vladimir Putin by supplying more weapons to Ukraine, 
by increasing the sanctions. G7 unity has been vital during this crisis to protect freedom and democracy and we'll continue to work together to do just that. Diesel prices have soared to a new record high despite the cut in fuel duty. Government data shows the average cost this week was 178.4 pence per litre. It means filling up a typical 55-litre family diesel car is now around £26 more expensive than it was a year ago. The Queen has arrived for day two of the Royal Windsor Horse Show. After missing the state opening of Parliament earlier in the week, there had been speculation she might not attend the annual event. More than 500 horses and 1,000 performers are taking part in the grounds of Windsor Castle. She's attended every year since it started in 1943. It's the first major event in the Queen's Platinum Jubilee festivities, celebrating her 70-year reign. And Amir Khan has announced the end of his boxing career, confirming his retirement in a social media post. Khan became an overnight sensation after winning an Olympic silver medal at the 2004 Athens Summer Games. He was just 17 years old. He then turned professional, becoming unified world champion and establishing himself as one of the country's most celebrated boxers. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now, though. It's back to Liam and on the money. And coming up on the money today, energy bosses are warning a windfall tax would lead to less investment in UK oil and gas projects, undermining our energy security. Ministers are signalling they may impose such a tax anyway. Who's right? We'll hold a detailed discussion. Plus, if you booked a holiday and you're waiting for a new passport, you could be in line for compensation if that passport doesn't show up in time. The efficiency of the passport office and the broader civil service is coming under serious scrutiny. Do we need more or fewer mandarins? And each day on The Money features an in-depth Money Talks interview. Well, today we're meeting small businesses commissioner Liz Barclay, the woman the government's asked to help. Our small and medium-sized firms, a former boss of Citizens Advice, She's taken a particular interest in late payment culture, a problem that blights countless small firms across Britain. That's later in the show. And as ever, I want your opinions, questions, ideas. What do you think of the issues raised in today's On The Money? Email me at gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet at gbnews. I'll read out some of your messages later in the show, so stay with us because this is GB News. I'm Liam Halligan and you're On The Money. Now, BP's chief executive, Bernard Looney, has this morning warned that Britain's energy security is at risk if the government imposes a windfall tax on oil companies. He said that would create a less stable environment, environment for investment in the North Sea and elsewhere, potentially holding back plans to wean the UK off overseas oil and gas. Energy bosses are becoming more vocal. Why? Because they know that ministers having previously ruled out such a windfall tax, may be about to change their mind. During his March spring statement, Rishi Sunak was criticised for not doing more to help low-income households struggling with their energy bills. Back then, he ruled out a windfall tax, even though the profits of the large oil and gas companies have surged as energy prices have spiralled due to war in Ukraine. Now, though, Rishi Sunak's changing his tune. The Chancellor has just said he's, quote, pragmatic about the idea of introducing a windfall tax on energy companies, even though he's, quote, not naturally attracted to the idea. What's going on? Well, motorist campaign groups and some ministers are concerned the big oil companies are not passing on the Chancellor's 5% 5 reduction in fuel duty, with petrol and diesel prices on the core forecourts not reflecting that tax cut. And while the government's keen that energy and giants invest more in the North Sea and are issuing more licences to allow that, the pressure to extend help to hard-pressed households is building and a windfall tax could help finance that. Look, here's the thing. The Cabinet's split deeply over this windfall tax, a policy Labour's been promoting for weeks. 
Since the late 1990s, UK oil and gas production has fallen by around two thirds. And more investment by energy companies is needed. But BP announced record quarterly profits of £5 billion last week, with Shell's quarterly profits a record £7.3 billion. And ultimately, the political logic of this move, taxing businesses that don't vote to help cash-strapped households that do, may prove irresistible. And that's our On The Money question today. Is a windfall tax on UK energy giants now inevitable? Growing up discussions with people who know their stuff. That's what we do here. Talking of which, here's Malcolm Grimston. He's Senior Research Fellow at the Centre for Energy Policy and Tech at Imperial College. Robert Palmer joins us, Director of the Tax Justice UK Network. And Victoria Hewson joins us down the line. She's Head of Regulatory Affairs and Research Associates at the Institute of Economic Affairs. There you are, Victoria. Great to have you back on the show. And here she is. As ever, Helen Thomas, she is the CEO and founder of Blonde Money, friend of the show. Great to have you with us too, Helen. Let's talk to you first, Robert. So Tax Justice UK does know the idea, you know, you do back this windfall tax. Labour Party's backed the windfall tax. You've now got a Chancellor who really ruled it out in strong language suddenly. He's pragmatic. Well, I think what you're hearing is the screeching of a U-turn happening in Westminster. Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson... Uh, exactly. Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson know that there are millions of families out in the country who do not have enough money to pay for food. We're about to see rocketing energy bills in the autumn. And these oil and gas giants, BP and Shell, have made billions of pounds of profits in part because of the war in Ukraine and sky-high oil and gas prices. So I think it is a political no-brainer to impose a windfall tax on these bumper profits and use the money to reduce energy bills and help uh, struggling households. Victoria Houston, let's go to you. You are uh, from the Institute of Economic Affairs. I suspect you're against the windfall tax. I am against the windfall tax uh, for, for many reasons. Uh, you, you alluded just now to the, the, the risk that it will deter investment at a time when we need it the most in the interests of our energy security. I'm here in Warsaw at the moment at an economic policy conference. And as you can imagine, everyone here is talking about energy security in the geopolitical context. And the message is very clearly, we must invest in supply and in diversity of supply. And I'm sorry, deterring investment in North Sea oil and gas exploration is just the exact opposite of what we need to be doing at present to address this supply crunch that has been caused not only by the, the geopolitical issue and trying to move away from Russian oil and gas, but by generations of government policies, taxes, subsidies, regulation, bans on fracking, all of these things have led us to where we are. And adding in another layer of tax and regulation that will deter investment is, is the exact opposite of what we need to be doing. Malcolm Grimston, as Victoria Houston and others often point out, are oil and gas companies or oil and gas companies operating here in the UK, because of course they're not all British, they already pay a supplementary tax. They already pay a higher rate of corporation tax, as you know. Should they pay more? I'm very sceptical. Uh, two years ago, BP posted a loss. Uh, you can't just look at a single year. You need to look at the whole 30-year mm. horizon of big investments, and they are enormous investments. And frankly, just quoting figures like 5 billion or 7 billion don't mean much unless you're looking at the underlying asset base that's supporting that uh, uh, that income. Um, and so we, we've seen uh, windfall taxes before. The Blair government introduced a windfall tax on the electricity supply companies. The newly privatised utilities, that's yeah. right. Yeah, within five years... it was years... legal, it went to court and it was legal. Oh, yes, indeed, yeah. I mean, I, I, government can do this. Mm. But within five years, the electricity supply industry was bust within the UK. Companies were going out of business, as we're seeing today in the supply side of the company, because, as uh, uh, yeah, it's been said, the, you need to look at the whole uh, cycle. If you don't let these companies make a large amount of money at the right point in the cycle, then they're going to not invest. They're going to say there's no point in us investing because when we get to this point of the cycle next time, we won't be allowed to make a return and pay ourselves back for what we've just invested. You can do that, but it means then that government has to step in, and you wonder what's the point of government taking away the money from the oil industries and then having to spend it on the investment the oil industry would have made. 
Helen Thomas, you've worked at the top of politics. You used to advise uh, ministers, shadow chancellors and so on. These headline profit numbers, they are pretty difficult to justify in the current climate. And, of course, um, you, you've now got a situation where households are cash-strapped and they're seeing these oil and gas companies make a lot of money. They are, and I, um, I can see the initial point here of it looks politically very attractive. Now, um, there is, however, as we've just heard, uh, over a longer time period, it, you can end up uh, having to... You know, government may even have to bail things out. So, mm. it, you know, you end up paying the price further down the line. So the question is the short-term political gain. And what is surprising to me is mm. what you began with, which is the U-turn. Mm. If you want to do this, do it. Mm. Don't say you won't, then they, you they might... Mess. Then you might... Pro yeah. And actually, that's even more damaging yeah. to business because they think you're setting out a path and you're clear, and then if you flip a few weeks later because of X, Y, Z... Uh, party gate fines happen, who yeah, knows yeah. why. Yeah. Um, that's also very damaging to business. Victoria, let me go back to you. I mean, of course, Malcolm Grimston's right. We can't just quote headline profit figures. It's much more complicated than that. On the other hand, Bernard Looney did tell sh a shareholders meeting that his company was a cash machine. On the other hand, a lot of these profits are being used for share buybacks. Now, you all know that means that companies buy back their own shares, boost their share prices, executives get bigger bonuses. It doesn't look good, does it? Even for those of us who back capitalism staunchly and who don't want a windfall tax. Well, I'm very much in favour of companies making profits. Uh, you know, Me too. The rather paltry pension fund that may well be invested in BP. I, I, I don't I don't know whether it is or not. I'll have to ask my uh, my uh, my financial advisor. But I, I just think, you know, we all do actually rely on these companies making profits as well as supplying us with energy. And, uh, you know, Helen's completely right. The, the, the sort of ad hoc day-to-day -day changes in direction that we're seeing on this question, with it being teased uh, and then half dismissed and then n not really confirmed uh, either way, and so it's hanging over the industry, is very bad for investment, not just in the oil and gas sector, but for all industries uh, in Britain who crave stability of regulation, stability of tax, who look very um, negatively at retrospective tax and this kind of unpredictable Polit politically driven decision making, this is going to be taken note of by industries, not just within oil and gas. And I should also add as well, the industry that's making the most here, the, the real windfall here, is actually going to the wind farm generators who are um, protected from, um, from market risk by contracts for differences that give them a sort of floor price that, that the government will always make sure they're going to get a certain minimum price. But because energy prices are so high at the moment, it's better for these wind farm operators to put um, to, to charge the, the normal market price. And so they are uh, basically insulated from risk and scooping up the benefits of high prices. To me, this is where the real windfall is, but we're not really talking about the um, the, the, the way that the, the, the renewable sector that's been subsidised with all of our taxes, uh, the, 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 the duties um, on our energy bills, uh, are, are being sort of hoovered up by these wind farm and renewables companies, and they are the ones that are seeing the real windfall here. Just briefly, Victoria, I guess you would also want, if the government wants to save money, help people with their fuel bills, you'd take off those subsidies to renewables that are about a quarter of our electricity bills still. Well, this is it, you know, and the the the, um, the renewables obligation and all of these things that we are subsidising as consumers, um, it, it's not working as it was intended to do. It wasn't supposed to make the wind farm operators billionaires, which is kind of what's uh, the direction that, that it's going in at present. And what we really need is diversity of supply. We need to not be turning our back and punishing oil and gas uh, providers. We should be encouraging them to invest because we are always going to need oil, gas, generation for uh, for our grid for stability and you know we can't rely on on renewables unfortunately we don't have the climate for it and so rather than punishing these companies for making profit from 
delivering essential uh, supplies to our whole economy and supporting our way of life, we should, um, you know, we should be looking at making better ways to incentivize them to, de to develop uh, and, uh, and provide more uh, energy to get us out of this supply crunch. Victoria Houston, thanks a lot for that contribution. You are from the Institute of Economic Affairs. We look forward to having you on the show in the future. Good luck at your conference in Warsaw. This is On The Money with me, Liam Halligan. After the break, we'll keep this discussion going. Some say a windfall tax would be bad as it would lower the energy giant share prices impacting millions of pension pots. Indeed, Victoria Houston just made that point. Is it a valid argument? We'll find out after the break. Stay with us, you're on the money. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You're with us on TV, radio, or online every morning. It's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a Brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. And welcome back. It's 1.22 and you're on the money. We are discussing a possible windfall tax on oil and gas companies operating in the UK because ministers do seem to be moving in favour of such a move, channelling the proceeds to households struggling with fuel bills. Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, is now pragmatic towards the idea, having previously ruled it out. Now, one argument against a windfall tax that's been mooted is that the shares of companies like BP would lose value if such a tax was used, and that in turn would undermine pensions held by millions of people. How valid is that argument? Well, someone who should know is independent consultant John Ralph. He is one of the UK's leading pensions <coughs> analysts, and he joins us now. John, great to be with you. We've done a lot of work together in the past. You're always welcome here on The Money. Thanks for joining us. What do you make of this argument that some of the oil and gas companies have put forward that if their shares get hammered, uh, pension pots across the UK will dwindle? Um, hello, Liam. Yes, it's been a while. Thanks very much for having me. It's worth repeating before I answer your question, and I'm not ducking your question, that the tax that we're talking about would only be on North Sea profits, not on overall worldwide profits of Shell or BP or any of these other companies. Um, I looked at the production this morning of uh, uh, oil and gas in, in, in the North Sea. The two big producers are companies I have to say I've never heard of, and I won't quote them, I won't, won't embarrass anyone. But the amounts that we're talking about are relatively small. There is all, already at the moment an unusual tax regime which is imposed on um, North Sea oil producers. They already pay more than... Um, uh, a, a normal a normal company. Um, the surcharge that they pay, the moment, moment they're paying 30% and a 10% surcharge. If you impose, let's say, a 20% surcharge, again, it's worth repeating that that would 
uh, that would raise about two billion pounds. Again, I'm aware I haven't quite answered your question yet, Liam. I'll come on to that. But that two billion pounds that's raised this year uh, could be used, obviously, as we've had the discussion, to alleviate people's uh, energy bills. My personal view, for what it's worth, is that this shouldn't be viewed as a windfall tax. It shouldn't be viewed as a one-off. It should be viewed as a permanent increase in the surcharge, taking the surcharge from 10% to 20%. And most importantly, that that goes both ways. So if in the future, for whatever reason, um, North Sea profits are, d are down, they may, uh, uh, companies actually make uh, losses, then there's a symmetry involved and they get a tax rebate rather than simply, you know, all the banging of the drum and saying this is absolutely outrageous. BP's made squillion, billion, trillion. Um, let's impose a, a levy on them. To come back and answer your question, markets generally dislike uncertainty. So at the moment, we have an uncertainty hanging over the share price of BP, the share price of Shell and, and, and there are various other companies. And there is an argument for saying, once you have made a decision and that decision has been communicated, increasing the surcharge from 10% to 20%, everybody breathes a sigh of relief and says, oh, actually, that's okay. We know where we are. There's a degree of certainty. We, the companies, can plan. Um, we, investors, can plan. Um, the percentage of shares, um, uh, the percentage of shares of BP and Shell owned by UK pension funds is pretty small. It really is pretty small. Um, the impact, therefore, of, uh, I don't want to say a modest tax, because that's, that's a matter of opinion, but the impact of a modest tax um, on the overall profits of BP, the overall profits of Shell, I wrote it down this morning, even I was quite surprised, BP has a market capitalization of £78 billion. It's a huge company. Shell is more than twice the size, £170 billion. Is it going to make any difference? M my view is it's not going to make a heap of a difference. Obviously, interesting discussion there, insights, analysis. That's very, very useful for us. So, Robert, the argument well, doesn't really stack up, according to John Rowe. I mean, I'm, it isn't really going to impact pension pots because BP's making profits all over the world. This is just on the North Sea. And even quite a heavy tax on them, as John Ralph says, wouldn't actually impact their broader profits all that much. So it's not going to impact pensioners. The boss of BP a couple of days ago said it wouldn't impact investment. It feels as though the arguments against this are falling as we discuss. And I think it's important to think about the bigger context, which is that the North Sea oil tax regime is one of the most generous in the world. Look at Norway. They have a trillion dollar public investment fund from their oil wealth. Where's our trillion dollar public investment fund? They also have a completely could... nationalised gas industry, but right? Which we... I mean, there's no private investment. But, in but I, think, I think it's just important when we're talking about the tax rate to look at where we're starting from. There's huge tax subsidies that these companies get. Only a few years ago, Shell was actually being paid by us, by the taxpayers, as part of their North Sea oil thing. So I think a windfall tax makes sense from a political point of view and an economic point of view. Malcolm Grimston, the arguments against the windfall tax are falling day by day, says Robert Palmer. I think there's certainly a political shift uh, going on. But the fundamentals, uh, if all we're saying is, OK, so the oil companies will just stop investing in the North Sea, they'll invest elsewhere. That in itself is, is a threat to our economy, both because of balance of payments issues and probably ultimately about cost as well, because getting uh, source, and certainly environmentally, if you can source your oil and gas closer to where you're going to use it, then mm. you don't have the transport costs, uh, both environmental and economic costs of transportation. And uh, it comes back to the point that if we tax them specifically on the North Sea investments, then specifically North Sea investments are going to look less attractive. That's not, that's, that's just... But they're sense. still quite attractive. Pr pretty much all North Sea oil and gas, given that it's gone down by two thirds <laughs> since the millennium, pretty much all of it's going to be used in the UK. You're not transporting it very far. It's not like you've got to ship it to Asia, is it? 
No, I'm not sure where our gas... I mean, some of our gas is exported, ironically, because of the import arrangements we have with Norway, which are, which are very uh, powerful. Um, but, yes, ultimately, uh, we've seen uh, our dependence on imported gas growing year on year. And if you leave it under the sea, which we can do, mm. then that import's going to grow. We've got to get at it for it to mean anything. And that's going to... If we say to the companies, invest, but if you make money, we're going to take it away from you, then clearly that's going to be less attractive. might not stop it, but it's going to be less attractive. Helen, it's an economic, a corporate, a business, a political conundrum. So I turn to you. What's going to happen? What's going to happen <laughs> is I think they will do... So I think Rishi Sunak and the Treasury will come up with some sort of windfall tax. He does seem to like to over-engineer things. Yep. So no doubt it'll be some tax now, rebate later, paid over X number of years, etc. Gordon Brown style, clever, clever policy. Uh, yeah, yes, which, you know, for the signalling impact and the sentiment boost and maybe the vote winning mm. that we've discussed with Robert over here um, is a bit pointless to aim your engineer it. But I take a much bigger picture question here, which is, we heard some of the numbers there, what was it, two or three billion, maybe a bit more than that, that it could raise. Yeah. That is a drop in the ocean. Mm of what they need to spend mm. to help people. And it's not just a one-off. It's not. I mean, it's not just going to be now. It's not just going to be October. We're in a protracted conflict. Inflation's going to remain high. This if you think a penny on income tax raises about five or six billion, I mean, this is not a huge amount of money this would raise, right? No, and then you have to But they want off. a political hit. They want to show that they're listening. We're going to beat up the big oil and gas companies and we're going to give the money to you. That is politically attractive. It, it, it feels that way, although I'm sure the Labour Party would be delighted, given they came up with it first. You know, Rachel Reeves stood up and said and that. And then the Tories, oh, we did a windfall tax in 1981, which they did under Geoffrey Howe on the banks. So. Well, there you go. But it's it, <laughs> but it's not going to be the end of it, is it? There'll be, there'll be more that needs to be done. And I guess, um, you know, the, uh, for the damage it may well do economically long-term um, and some of the other issues that we talked about, I would just say, look, for bang for your buck, for, for delivering on the economy and helping people, mm. is this the right path mm. to take? Is it worth the candle? Yeah. Helen Thomas, as ever, CEO and founder of Blonde Money. Robert Palmer, good to have you in the studio. You are from UK Tax Justice and Malcolm Grimston from Imperial College. Thanks a lot to all my guests. A fabulous discussion. It will go on and on. But I think in the end, they're going to go for it. There you go. This is On The Money with me, Liam Halligan. Coming up, today's Money Talks interview is with Small Businesses Commissioner Liz Barkley. She'll be talking about helping the UK's small and medium-sized firms, especially when it comes to those pesky late payments that blight our economy. But first, it's the GB News headlines with Rhiannon Jones. Thank you, Liam. It's 1.32, your top stories from the GB Newsroom. Unions are threatening national strikes over government plans to axe around 90,000 civil service jobs. The Prime Minister wants to free up billions of pounds to ease the cost of living crisis. Downing Street hasn't ruled out compulsory redundancies, but it's hoped a lot of the cuts will occur through natural attrition. The DUP says blocking the election of a Speaker to the Northern Ireland Assembly sends a message to the EU and the government that the post-Brexit trading agreement isn't working. Party leader Sir Geoffrey Donaldson also says they won't nominate a Deputy First Minister, preventing a new executive from forming. If the European Union is serious about protecting the political institutions and the Belfast Agreement and its successor agreements, the basis of political progress and stability in Northern Ireland then they know what they need to do. And equally, the same message is there for our own government as well. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe's meeting the Prime Minister at Downing Street. The former British aid worker who was held captive for six years in Iran is speaking to Boris Johnson for the first time since returning to the UK in March. They're expected to discuss why it took so long to secure her release and how the government can help other British citizens who are being held hostage abroad. And the Queen has arrived for day two of the Royal Windsor Horse Show, looking smiley and relaxed for one of the highlights of her year. More than 500 horses and 1,000 performers are taking part in the grounds of Windsor Castle. It's the first major event in the Queen's Platinum Jubilee festivities, celebrating her 70-year reign. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News.
Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound is 1.22 to the dollar. The pound is 1.17 to the euro. And the price of gold currently stands at £1,486.31 per ounce. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for real-time investment. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot. 4pm until 6pm as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify and we try to make sense of it for you. Frasier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. And welcome back. You are on the money. It's 1.36. Now, it's been a while since many of us have been abroad with COVID restrictions limiting foreign travel. But if you are lucky enough to be jetting off to the sun this summer, you might need to renew your passport. And in the unlucky instance, your passport is, is delayed and you miss your trip, it turns out you may be entitled to claim the partial cost of your holiday and compensation if you paid for premium or fast-track service with a Manchester's passport office. Well, Paul Briston, founder of the law firm Britain and Time, can tell us more. Paul Britton, great to have you in the show. I am. Tell us about this service. I can get money back? You can get money back. It's unfortunate you can't get it on the standard service. I mean, what they quote is that it's up to a 10-week turnaround. But when you pay for the fast track or the premium service, they guarantee a turnaround time. For the fast track, it's a five-day, and for the premium, it's a one-day turnaround. Now, if they don't get your passport back to you in those timelines, then you would be entitled to compensation, either for the rearrangement of flights, let's say the passport arrives just a day after your flights, and you're able to rearrange it, then they'll pay for the, the cost of the rearrangement. Um, if you do lose your entire holiday, then that's a different claim, um, and you could have your entire holiday paid for you in compensation. Key question, how much is it to do the fast track thing and the premium thing compared to the normal thing? So the standard... Scientific ter terms, though. <laughs> You're trying to catch me out. <laughs> so the, the standard term is, uh, is around £70, yep. um, but like I said, no guarantee. Yep. The fast track, 140 and the premium service, which is the one-day turnaround, is £177. Big difference, £170, £140. If you want to be sure you've got your passport for your holiday. That's it's a, a big difference. And, and, like and right, even then, you might not get it. You might have to then go through the rigmarole of compensation. That's, that's right. I mean, we're seeing a lot of these claims coming yeah. through, through now, um, partly because of um, COVID. 
the lockdowns and even the vaccination rollout. You've got to get so many vaccinations before you can go to certain locations. People are quick to book their holidays, but not quick to check the expiry date on their passport. Indeed, indeed. They pick it up, they see that it's either expired, expiring, or perhaps while they're away. And some of these destinations that they go to, uh, you need to have a passport for at least six months of validity. Yeah, that's right. Um, so we're seeing an influx of these applications, which again is putting pressure on HM Passport Office. Key question number two, once you've put in a submission under the standard service, can you then upgrade it to a faster service? I don't know the answer to that. You'd have to ask the passport office. I mean, that is... I mean, because some people, rather than... Mm. I mean, just the psychological impact of missing your holiday, in, in some senses, even if you do manage to get full compensation for the amount of money you've spent, mm. it's still not the same, is it? Because... I shouldn't think you could upgrade. Yeah. You could probably make a separate application, but then you'd be paying the fee again and oh, you okay. try to seek a refund of your standard service. Yeah, that's interesting. That's if, interesting. if they fail on the fast track or the premium service, yeah. they will refund the difference between... Yeah the standard service and the premium one. So is your firm Britain and Time, right? Britain and Time solicitors. Yeah, yeah are, you, are you specifically trying to help people to get through this rigmarole? We offer fixed fee consultations, so we, we can normally deal with it that way. Um, it's not very cost effective to use solicitors, yeah. unless, of course, there is a significant loss. Yes. Um, in that case, then you should always get independent legal advice. Can you claim that back from the passport office? Unlikely they'll meet that cost. There are circumstances, if they're extreme and the losses are substantial, where they would consider that sort of claim as well. It's kind of mad, isn't it? We're one of the most advanced countries in the world and people are, may or may not get their passport it's, it's in just ten the, weeks. It's I mean... the exceptional circumstances, is it, with the backlog um, and processing so many applications and so many people wanting to go away. I mean, do, do, do you see... Is it getting better? Do you see any light at the end of the tunnel or is it the light of an oncoming train of even more delays? There's always light here <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the tunnel. It's um, Friday, there's always yeah, light. Yeah, there's always light. Uh, but they have increased the standard turn turnaround time. It was four weeks, six, eight, and now they're up to ten weeks. So it looks like it's getting worse. Blimey. Well, Paul Britton of Britain and Times Listers, thanks a lot for coming into you, the Liam. studio. The advice you've given our viewers. Great. It's great to have you with us. But what a difficult situation. You book a holiday, you don't know if you're going to get your passport. Crikey. Now, the backlog of passport applications may point to inefficiencies in parts of our civil service, not least the passport office itself. Yet Boris Johnson yesterday ordered ministers to cut more than 90,000 civil service jobs with the aim of freeing up £3.5 billion to ease the cost of living crisis. But the announcement was described as either another headline-grabbing stunt or a reckless slash-and-burn to public services by the FDA, the Civil Service Union. Well, to discuss this, I thought I'd call on friend of the show Vicky Price, who used to run the government's economic service. She was a very senior civil servant indeed. She knows Whitehall well. Vicky, great to see you. Thanks a lot for breaking into your Friday for us. What do you make of Jacob Rees-Mogg's claim that all the government is looking to do is to take the civil service back to the numbers it was at in 2016? The truth is that the number of civil servants has increased quite substantially since the referendum. Uh, first of all, in order to deal with what the implications of that vote meant for policy, so loads more policy people were employed. And then, of course, we had COVID, and loads of policy people were employed to deal with that as well. Plus, of course, you had to have the whole admin in terms of making sure that the National Health Service was probably run. But that is, of course, in terms of the numbers of, of people working in the National Health Service, that's public servants. It's not necessarily the civil servants. Civil servants are the ones who mainly do the policy and ensure that the machine at least sort of works properly. So there's been this big increase in thinking about new issues that the government had to deal with, obviously. Huge amount of help given through COVID. We had to renegotiate all the trade agreements that were there with the EU once we actually left the EU. We've also had to think of new uh, agencies and departments we, wish we have created, like the Brexit department, for example, which doesn't exist right now, but then now you have one uh, department which has had to extend its remit, which is the trade department, to deal with trade disputes, uh, which we never had to do before because the EU did for us. So it was inevitable that there would be that increase, but there had already been a review of the numbers of civil servants. We had the a spending review, the public, you know, the spending review that happens periodically. And in October, at the same time as the budget, 
Uh, we also had the spending review announced for the next three years, and that included already a reduction back to at least 2019 levels, so before the pandemic, which would have meant probably 53,000 civil servants going. So we're talking about an additional relatively small number, but it makes the headlines and mm -hmm. it's supposed to save us money. But we do know for well that if the civil servants don't do it, we tend to give it to outsiders to do, and it probably ends up costing just as much. Vicky, let me ask you this as well. It will be on the minds of lots of viewers and listeners of course, working practices are different since the pandemic. They'll never be the same again. There will be more working from home. Technology's leapt forward. There are some efficiencies in some aspects of working from home. But do you, is there any sense you have that some civil servants are maybe trying to push that too far? Certainly, Jacob Rees-Mogg famously was leaving notes on desks in the Cabinet Office when he came in on a Monday morning and, in his words, Almost no one was there. Well, no, I, I certainly haven't um, felt that at all from anyone I'm talking to. It has differed from department to department. In some cases, you absolutely needed to be there. In those that you didn't need to be there, you could do it perfectly well at home. People have continued to do it, but have a hybrid environment, so they go in a few days a week. The interesting thing is that during this whole period, of course, the civil service has been rethinking its own policy in terms of the buildings that it has. So they have been cutting back. So departments are being merged in terms of the position where they're going to find themselves in in the future in terms of moving bodies and desks to places where it's perhaps you know better handled because they're all together and it's cheaper to, to manage. Uh, also, when leases are, have expired, what I've been hearing is that they've been given up, if you like. So the actual estate is being reduced. So the idea of having all these civil servants while they're still there, I mean, we're talking about 475,000 civil servants, all <laughs> going back to places where the desks aren't there, where you can't actually work properly and where we know full well the productivity in most areas has, if anything, improved because of the way in which we're working right now, makes very little sense. It's a conundrum. It's a debate. The debate will go on. Vicky, great to have you on the show and look forward to having you back in the studio sometime soon. Vicky Price there, who used to run the government's economic service, a former very senior civil servant, giving us her insights. Now, it's time for my daily interview series, Money Talks. And today we're joined by Liz Barclay, the government's small business commissioner. Small and medium-sized enterprises, or SMEs, they are the lifeblood of the British economy. They account for 99% of all businesses, around two-thirds of all employment, and half are commercial turnover. Liz Barclay's been small business commissioner since last year. She's the first woman to carry out this important job. She's formerly boss of Citizens Advice. She's also has a lot of experience in the media, in television and radio production, and, of course, presenting. In her new role, she's spearheading a national effort to crack down on late payment practices, which cause thousands of small businesses to close each year. And here she is in the studio, Liz Barkley, my latest guest on Money Talks. Liz, great to have you in the studio, not least because I've heard you on the radio so much over the years. Well, thank you years. for inviting me. And I must... I, OK, I'll, I'll, com I'll confess. So I grew up with parents who ran a small business and late payment was the absolute bane of our lives. Tiny little building company of two or three people in a van, subcontracting off big building companies, and late payment was just endemic. We almost lost our house several times. And you all know, I know you've campaigned on this as a journalist, you've talked about it as a journalist. Absolutely. It's great you're trying to do this on the national stage. How mad am I? <laughs> <laughs> it's a big job. Yeah. Uh, it's a four-year rule, so there's a lot to be done. But it's really interesting that you should say that because I do remember going on air uh, in a different, uh, obviously with a different broadcaster, very early... <laughs> Other one, broadcasters are available. They are. Uh, very early one morning, mm. uh, on a programme that still runs very early one yeah. morning, and we were talking then, 30 years ago, yeah. about late yeah. payments. Um, and I think the first thing I would say is I've realised, since I took the job in July, we're not talking about late payments all of the time, as in overdue invoices. Quite often, we're also talking about long extended payment mm. terms. And gamesmanship. Ah, uh, well. You know, oh, we'll pay you 80 pence in the pound, we'll give you four fifths of what we owe you if you sign this bit of paper. 
that we don't owe you anything else or we might pay you 100% in six months' time. You're there's, running a small business, cash there's flow. There's some of that. There there's, is some of, that, some of that, definitely. There's some of that conspiracy going on in order to make your your books look well, yeah. look good. Um, but there's quite a lot of incompetence and there's quite a lot of lack of updating of processes. You know, so what we're finding is in the middle, there's a whole tranche of businesses that simply have outdated processes. No investment has gone in and it actually takes them longer than 30 days to pay you, mm. believe it or not. But the pandemic has shown that there are an awful lot of companies that realised they needed to pay the small suppliers faster and they did it. They cracked it. They really got on with it. We've seen payments shrink in some big companies to seven days even, mm. 15 days, seven days. Mm. So it can be done if you put the investment into doing it. It's that lots of other companies, for them, it's not a priority. They've got conflicting priorities in what they spend their money on and they don't invest in the payment systems. And that's really difficult for small businesses. And at the other end, there's the small business that simply says, OK, I'm so excited and I've done this. I've mm. been freelance most of my working mm. life mm. and I have been so excited about a piece of work that mm. I've said... OK, I'll take it mm. without asking, when are you going to pay me? Yeah, that's and right. it is the most basic, fundamental question. When is the money going to hit my bank account? A few years ago, for yet another broadcaster, I made a documentary about Carillion, which, of course, went bust, owing tens of billion, tens of millions of pounds to small businesses. Uh, and the, the late payment practices I found at Carillion, it was, it was... I mean, their standard payment was 90 days. Three months! to get your money, their standard payment was 90 days. But Liam, and I came across many, many suppliers who were waiting much, longer. much longer, longer. And Carillion was saying, they were saying, oh, we'll give you, we'll give you half of it, we'll give you two thirds of it, and then you can you know, go away uh, and never come back. But Absolutely what, outrageous. But what we find is that quite often a small business will have agreed to standard payments, standard mm. terms, mm. and not asked what it is. Mm. And mm. then they expect to be paid in 30 days and they think the payment's late, mm. when in actual fact they've signed a piece of paper that said standard terms. And you, you're talking about 90 days. I've seen 120 yeah. days. Yeah. I'm hearing about 150 days. And somebody the other day told me about... 360 days a before year they get to them. get your money. That's a year. Now, I you, mean, that's not incompetence. That's just deep cynicism, you ask, right? That's you just ask cynical. Yourself, you ask yourself, is that an ethical company? Do no. I want to do business with them? Yeah, but you you might have, have to. to be you, might no, have to. you have to be brave enough to walk away because the chances are you're going to be bust before you get paid. So we, we have to tackle this from both ends. We have to say to the small businesses, you're going to have to not work for those bad payers. And this is happening, apparently, across the manufacturing sector. The manufacturers, the big companies, are finding it difficult to get the skills because mm. these freelancers, the sole traders, the micro-businesses, are the talent that drives the business success. So they got a bit more power. So they, so they really want to work with you. And if you say, I'm not working with you because you don't pay on time, I'm going to work with that company, your rival, because they pay faster, that will start to change things. And we need investors and pension funds and, um, you know, anybody else who might want to work for a company to say, I want to know how fairly you're treating your small suppliers. Back in the day when you, you and I were growing up and getting interested in politics and policy and all the rest of it, you know, Michael Heseltine, who was business secretary at the time, president of the Board of Trade, it was called then, do you remember that? He said, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but he knew what he was doing, that late payment is recognised business practice. It's what the big guys do to squeeze the small guys, to stop them rising up, to stop them rivalling them. What can you do and if you're a small business and you're owed proper money? What do you do? Do you go to the press? Do you keep knocking on the door of the owner? This sends people around the bend. Yes, it does. And you come to me. You come to... I've got a casework team that are absolutely dedicated to getting your money back. If you're a small I've business... I've got plenty of them. ..with fewer than 50... <laughs> well, interesting you should say that because <laughs> we find it really difficult to get small businesses to come along mm. and let somebody else intervene. Mm. What they do come along and ask is, how do I resolve this? Mm. So they will come and look at the website, find the interest rate calculator, because you can charge interest, find out how to charge compensation, and quite often that is enough to shift the dial and get the big business to pay. But the case workers are absolutely dedicated. They will do everything they possibly can to keep the business relationship between you and that customer 
as well as get your money back. Because that's the thing that most people are really worried about, damaging that working of relationship. Course. They want the next piece of, of work that's coming down the pipeline. Do we need a, a change in the law? Do we need more than just well-intentioned and it, obviously very highly informed... I am well-intentioned. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> I'm a huge admirer of, of your journalism and many of our viewers and listeners will be as well. They'll hear your voice and they'll say, yeah, I know this person. And it, I actually think... I'm not just saying this. I think it's great that the government have appointed someone like you with such a track record in standing up for consumers, small businesses and so on. But what do we really need to happen? We need... Uh, we need boards of big companies to say... What, how well are we treating our small suppliers? We want to know what our own payment practices are in this firm. Yeah. And a lot of boards and chairs say to me, that's an operational issue, we don't ask yeah. those questions. No, it's not. Yeah. It's about your company, it's about the practices, it's about the ethics. We need that to happen because it's part of governance, it's part of social and levelling up, it's part of reaching net zero. It's really important and we need audit of payment practices. We also know, and we're almost out of time, but I have to mention that a lot of contractors, a lot of small businesses watching this, listening to this will say, one of the worst late payers is the state, is the government. Um, you may say that. Things have improved vastly across government. And when we look at the data, we can see that we need to shift some of the private sector to being as good payers as government, we do know that there are still problems. There's mm. lots of work to be done. That's the Cabinet Office's job. Um, the private sector is my job. And please, 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 if you are listening and you're a big company, you have got to pay, don't delay, because otherwise you'll lose the suppliers. They're the talent that drives your business success. And if you are a small business and you are in trouble, come and talk to us. Liz Barkley, Small Businesses Commissioner, great to have you on the show. Come back and let us know how you're, how you're getting on. Anything. Really good to have you with us. That's all we've got time for today, I'm afraid. Thanks for joining me. We'll be back on Monday at 1pm, continuing to focus on the cost of living crisis, helping you to beat the squeeze. Have a good weekend. And remember, this is GB News. I'm Liam Halligan, and that was On The Money. Hello again, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. Uh, bright and warm day for southern parts of the UK, but windy further north with rain for some, mostly the far north and northwest because of these weather fronts that are crossing the north of Scotland. And tightly packed isobars, uh, the further north you are, means that it will be a blustery day with wind gusts approaching gale force for the north of Scotland, where there will be spells of rain for the Northern Isles, the north and northwest of the mainland. Showery outbreaks elsewhere across western Scotland, damp over the hills of northwest England as well. A lot of cloud for Scotland, northern England, parts of Northern Ireland, but brighter skies further south. And uh, as a result, temperatures up to the high teens, perhaps 23 in London, more like 16, 17 for northern England and mid to low teens further north again. Now the spells of rain begin to ease overnight, but it will stay damp for the north and west of Scotland. Clear spells 